Welcome to the Ferret Voices podcast, a collection of conversations with leaders from across the industry, sharing tips and valuable insight into shaping the future of online identity. This podcast is brought to you by the people of Ferret, rebuilding trust in the digital world. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Ferret Voices, the podcast where we talk about fraud, compliance, technology, and all things related to identity verification. My name is Chris Hooper. I'm Director of Content and Creative here at Verif, and joining me today is Catherine Sharp, who is Head of the Financial Crime Product at Griffin Bank. Griffin is an API-first UK bank and full-stack banking as a service platform that was set up to help companies embed financial services into their own products. By managing complex infrastructure and compliance requirements, Griffin lets customers focus on what matters most, creating world-class products and experiences for their own users. With a keen focus on user experience, compliance, and a customer-first ethos, Griffin's approach uh, actually resonates very much with what we do here at Verif, and we're proud to enable them to, to deliver an, an elevated and optimized experience to customers. Today, I'm going to be talking to Catherine just to discuss some of the key market developments and fraud trends, how Griffin uh, collaborates with partners, uh, and what's in store for Griffin's future. So, Catherine, first of all, welcome, uh, and th- thanks for joining us. I'll give you a little bit of an intro there, but would you mind just telling us a bit more about your background and, uh, and maybe about what sort of your role at Griffin entails as well? Yeah, of course. Thanks so much for having me. So my background is in building financial crime product in the first line teams. Um, so I've worked in fintech for the last five years now and really focusing on how to build like a financial crime framework that enables um, fintechs to scale and grow um, as they gain more customers. And that's very much what I'm doing at Griffin. So I joined Griffin to design and then implement a financial crime framework from a first line perspective. So sort of working between the product, engineering, and operational teams um, to help us get ready for our first customers and then beyond that as well. It's such an uh, an excellent use case, I feel like, that uh, that, that, that Griffin has for Verif. Would would you mind just telling us a bit more about what Griffin actually does then and and, and specifically how Verif helps in that uh, that, that case? Yes. So I think you gave like a really good intro at the beginning on what Griffin does. So I think First and foremost, we're a bank and very much a bank that you can build on. And combined with that, we offer like a really strong um, tech platform as well. One of the things that we're really keen on at Griffin is being developer friendly. So we have a lot of modern APIs and then also like a sandbox, which is really cool because you get to play around with the product that we're building and see how they um, look for your own company. And one of those things that we've been building and that I've been very much focused on since I joined Griffin is a product called Verify, which is our onboarding tool. And that's kind of where Verify really came in to help us to provide identification and verification as part of that onboarding process. Excellent. Yeah, so it's a really, really interesting project, actually. And I think just to sort of take a little bit of a step back in time, if you like, so what were the, the sort of the challenges that uh, that first led you to use Verify in the first place? Was it just getting this project started and you knew that you had to have an external partner? Um, or were there other aspects to it as well? For us, it was starting with the idea that we knew we could build something really um, strong in-house in terms of a financial crime risk assessment, and that we had the experience there. But I think with Verif, we were really aligned in terms of like some of the areas that are important to us. So like I mentioned, the end-to-end user experience. And I think we saw the offering for IDNV and like how neatly that would fit into the process that we were building. I think we were also drawn to the fact that you have like an API first solution as well. So we could kind of ensure the consistency. And then also we could apply like our Griffin branding as part of the process, which is really important for us and like our business model. So I think that's kind of what drew us to you is that we saw this really great opportunity to almost collaborate in providing that kind of overall experience, but really focusing on the area that we knew we could do really well and then be able to take the product that you have and integrate that in a way that kind of complements what we're doing already. Yeah, that's a, that's a quite, quite a sort of common story I think I hear with, with customers a lot when I have these conversations around that kind of uh, almost like a personalized service that fits in with what it is that you're trying to do. I think we don't have a an off the peg solution, much to our frustration sometimes I should say as well, because it would make life a lot easier, but um, but but sort of tailoring what we provide to to each customer depending on what it is that they're after, I, I suppose. Um, so I, I guess again, so just just taking that sort of historical view for for the time set, uh, time being, were there any other, was it sort of a competitive scenario? Were you looking at other providers as well? I mean, what was it that made Verif sort of stand out in the crowd in in, in that sort of instance? Yeah, I mean, I think we touched on a few of them. I think it was very much um, in addition to the other things I mentioned. I think it's sort of like an alignment across values. I think it's really important that you know we're very quality driven, but we're also customer driven as well. You know, it might be a um, a process that 
we're doing to assess the risk of customers, but we very much want to put customers first. And so I think for us, we were really drawn to how Verif makes it seamless. You know, the fact that people can complete it easily, they're kind of guided through it. And then from the financial crime perspective and from my side, you know, the fact that you can offer different kind of risk labels and ability to do different things with that um, was a really great like addition to what we were looking for as well, because it felt like in that we could make sure that we were um, really able to assess the nuances of the financial crime risk, you know, rather than it being a binary thing. And then also that in doing that, customers weren't impacted. You know, we weren't putting them through a process that was super long or hard to do, and that would kind of put them off going through the onboarding process to begin with. Absolutely, absolutely. And I feel like that's that's always the balance, isn't it? Between you want this sort of level of fraud protection, but the, sort of the ultimate level of fraud protection is you don't have any customers. So, so, so it's a, it's sort of finding something there that is, you know, that balance in there that allows you to get people through the flow in, in, in a really sort of uh, sort of user-friendly way, but at the same time offering the level of protection that your customers require. Um, and just sort of on that then, are, are you able to sort of talk to some of the impacts of, uh, of, of implementing sort of ver- verif services? I mean, for you or for your extended customer base? Yeah, of course. So we're actually in a really exciting stage at the moment of starting with our first customers. Um, so we're still very early stage, but we've kind of got a view of who those initial first people are, so to speak. So I think an immediate impact for us was being able to complete verify on our direct customers. And that's a really major step of our onboarding experience. You know, the way that Griffin works is that we kind of onboard that direct customer and then that direct customer will have like a a book, so to speak, of customers. We kind of refer to those as nested customers. So to be able to kind of do that first stage, get direct customers in, identify and verify all the directors and persons of significant control was huge for us. It really kind of moved us forward. And then it also means that we're in a real state of like readiness for them being able to launch and offer products and accounts to nested customers as well. So I think the impact is very much been to kind of like help us through this process that we're in at the moment of you know like initial launch but then also scaling as well in the near future you, you mentioned at the beginning i think sort of some of the sort of the cultural similarities between uh between Verif and griffin and i think that uh that scalability is one as well is one, one something that we talk about a lot internally is is being able to grow with our customers so obviously we are vested we have a vested interest in in, in your success as well and, and when you're successful we we become successful as a sort of a byproduct of that so yeah that's a that's a really big thing for us as well and I just like to, to sort of move away from the from the verif angle for the time being. I think that was we've covered that quite well, and I think that sort of established the, the base of it, if you like. But I'd like to talk more in a more general sense about the sort of financial service industry, I suppose. And I think there's a lot of uh, a lot in the news around around digital banking and around digital banks, in, in, uh, particularly, it, especially in terms of sort of licensing, regulatory oversight, and, and, and all that kind of you know stuff. What uh, regulatory trends are you seeing at the moment? And, and are there any sort of key developments that, that you envisage that, that, that it would be worth sort of pointing out to an audience here that, um, that they should be watching out for? I'll speak mainly from a financial crime perspective, but I think it's a really interesting time at the moment in terms of regulatory trends. So I think one area that is a real focus at the moment and you're seeing a lot more emphasis on is fraud. So the payment service regulator is kind of bringing in new requirements on authorized push payment fraud in particular, known as APP fraud. And that's going to be a really big change for the industry. It's got a much bigger focus on reimbursement and bringing in more minimum standard. And that's kind of being applied across the banking sector as a whole. So that's going to be really interesting. I think also you're seeing some trends kind of responding to the environment that we're in at the moment. So we're in a cost of living crisis at the moment and People are turning a lot more than they maybe would have um, to like buy now, pay later product. I think you're starting to see the regulator pay a lot more attention to that and making sure that how that's offered is, you know, in a way that doesn't kind of put customers into more difficult situations. And then finally, like a really big thing kind of happening at the moment is the Economic Crime and Corporate Transparency Bill which is going through the legislative process at the moment. Again, I think that's going to have a really big impact. I think there's been a lot of talk, you know, for a long time now about some of the downfalls of companies' house and the way that companies are used to uh, launder money. And a lot of the bill is kind of focusing on that. And I think we'll go quite a long way in the industry of changing some of the ways that people onboard or monitor applications, you know, on an ongoing basis, in particular from companies. 
Yeah, I, th- I think that the sort of the face of, of banking has changed so much, hasn't it, over the last um, sort of couple of decades, I would say. And I think, you know, yeah, companies like Griffin, I guess, have, you know, it's, it's becoming easier and, and, and cheaper for financial services providers to, you know, to access financial products that were previously sort of time consuming or expensive. What is it that sort of excites you most about that particular trend? And I guess, is there is there a sort of a financial crime challenge to that as well? I think it's kind of around, I think for the first time, you know, over the last few years, we're really seeing that people who want to get access to financial services that are easy, um, it's a good product, like that's becoming more and more possible. Um, and that's really great to see because I think that's something that everyone deserves. I think we've been in a space for quite a long time where getting access to banking um, hasn't been easy for everyone. And so I think it's really exciting to kind of see it like a much more democratic process happening where, you know, you don't have to go into a branch or you don't need X and Y to be able to get the account. Um, and there's other ways of kind of thinking about how to onboard people. So I think that's great. And I think like that's a really important time um, for us to be in. And then obviously that kind of comes with its own financial crime challenges as well, because I think that ease of access can also mean that if you don't have the right controls in place, um, that can be more attractive um, to you know criminals, bad actors. And so I think it's just sort of about adapting with that. It's sort of, you know, we're not going to go back from this space, which no one would want. We're kind of in this process where I think there's going to be more and more innovation in the financial sector. And so I think it's about how then do you respond to that in a way that where possible keeps ahead or at least keeps pace with what's happening. And I think a lot of that is around, you know, being adaptive yourselves in the industry. And I think it's about really keeping a close eye on like trends and patterns so that you can um, respond to those and see what's happening. And I think that, um, you know, certainly what we're seeing a lot at the moment is, uh, and a lot of what we're hearing from our customers is around the big trend being, of course, you know, artificial intelligence and what it means for both for, for their fraud protection, but also if it's in the, you know, in the hands of people, that, that the fraudsters, if you like, uh, what does that mean for them and how they should prepare for it? And kind of on, on that sort of note, how do you sort of prioritize customer safety? I guess, we, is, there, is, there, is this sort of embedded into Griff, to Griff, sort of Griffin's culture, if you like, and, and, and how you sort of approach that sort of safety and safeguarding piece of, of, of people's information and that kind of thing? So I think customer safety can mean a lot of different things to people, can't it? And I think the way that we kind of think about it um, has probably got a few different layers. But I think first and foremost, it is what you mentioned. It's kind of like protection of customers, you know, uh, the facets of that. So like customer data and all those kind of good things. Customer duty was basically consumer duty um, coming into play. And a lot of what that talks about and speaks about in the regulation is what we'd already believed at Griffin and we'd already started um, implementing. Um, because I think really like for us, a massive part of our culture and something that we talk about a lot is thoughtfulness. And I think thoughtfulness is really important when you're thinking about prioritizing customer safety. Um, and if I look in, you know, at how we kind of approach product build at Griffin and how we think about customers, now, particularly from my perspective in operations, customer safety is prioritized in everything that we build. Um, you know, it's kind of discussed at each step um, and it's very much integrated rather than being an afterthought as well. Um, and so I think that means that we kind of really try and offer product from the perspective of how can we make this like the best possible for customers? And that includes how can we make, make you know, customers safe, make sure that all the right kind of safeguards are in place. Um, for them to have a great experience rather than worrying about using our, our platform and our product. Yeah, absolutely. I think I, I really love that concept actually of sort of, of thoughtfulness and um, it's quite easy. Yeah, especially when you're dealing with big companies, the the, the the sort of the scale of customers they have, it's easy to think of as numbers, isn't it? But each one of those numbers is a person and uh, they've all got some, you know, they need to be sort of protected to different differing levels and that kind of thing. So I think to have that at the core of what you do, uh, it makes for a really interesting um, story to tell, actually, as a, in, in terms of I mean, think of things from a marketing point of view, obviously, and, and it's uh, it's a very it's a very powerful thing to take to the market, I think. And um, so, it just, just sort of thinking on sort of Griffin's kind of use case particularly, how do you differ from other financial services institutions in terms of the fraud that you that you would be facing, um, especially sort of I, I guess that that you're kind of uh, well, a banking as a service provider as well, so you've got sort of customers who have their own customers and that kind of thing, so. Is, is, is there sort of layers of fraud that you experience that may be sort of different to, to other areas of financial services? Yeah. 
So we're currently pre-launch. So I think we're too early in our journey right now to kind of see that difference in terms of how it's actually playing out. But I think what we do have and that we really want to leverage is that as we kind of go deeper into this journey um, of being um, like a BAS provider, that I think we have this amazing ability to see a lot of data across customers. And I think that's going to give us a really unique insight into trends and patterns of fraud. And I think that's going to make us um, be able to respond in a really powerful way as well. So I think having that relationship as a, um, you know, as a best provider means that we can kind of come at it from a way that's probably quite different to other um, fintech and other bank because we will be able to kind of see much more of a bird's eye view as well as kind of that granular day to day. And, and, and I guess the sort of the extended question from that then is it's not just having a view of it, right, but of, of any potential fraudulent activity, but what is it that you have in place to sort of mitigate it and protect your customers from it as well? Completely agree. I think it's not just spotting it, like you say, it's responding to that. So I think that we have um, like a really strong financial crime framework um, in place. I mentioned at the top around onboarding and the way that we think about that. And then we also um, have a lot of controls in place to kind of look at ongoing activity as well. And I think all of that is supported by like a really strong operational team and operational processes in place. It kind of goes back to that thoughtfulness point that I mentioned that I think for us, we really um, want to make sure that we're not just offering accounts, you know, we're offering an experience to direct customers and then also those nested customers I mentioned. And we really want to be and have built a platform that can support that um, and can do that in a really strong way. We mentioned about um, artificial intelligence, generative AI particularly being sort of the, the main, one of the main trends we're seeing from a fraud uh, point of view. What role do you think it will play in the future of fraud and, and sort of financial crime more generally? I think if we take a step back, obviously AI, you know, in general of AI, it can mean and has lots of different use cases. And I think there's lots of fascinating kind of like tangents within it as well. I think in terms of more broadly what it means for financial crime, I think it has a really powerful ability to automate processes that typically have generated a lot of manual work. Um, and I think what it will enable is people to really focus on where it's meaningful. I think we're going to be able to see that in freeing up that time, people in operations can focus a lot more on say like complex investigations. And I think that's going to be something that's really powerful um, because I think it will mean that we can become a lot smarter over time of really like where to pay attention. I also think that um, like with everything, there's a balance of it will be have a lot of really great use cases uh, in terms of like uh, benefits. I think it'll be interesting, you know, to see how the regulator responds to that. Um, I know like the EU at the moment is trying to push through an AI act and it'll be interesting to see, you know, what path the UK goes down, um, use a similar, an approach or a different one. And then what that means for fintechs and um, the financial service more broadly. And then I think balance with that is every time there's innovation, um, you know, it, it also benefits criminals as well. Um, I think generative AI is going to be really powerful and it's already been really powerful you know, for kind of creating deep fakes, for generating, um, you know, text to create a bunch of applications really quickly. And so I think whilst we're going to have an ability to use AI in a much more meaningful way in terms of like spotting patterns and being proactive and reactive, that's also going to have to be balanced with, you know, we're going to have to put in changes much more slowly probably than criminals are kind of able to use. And so I think there's going to be a real kind of balance over the next few years about how to um, ensure that fintechs, financial services are using AI in a way that's, you know, safe, it's fair as well. It's not introducing discrimination or bias. And then also trying to keep pace with criminals as well and what's emerging. And I think if we do it right, then I think there's a real opportunity, you know, I was kind of mentioning at the beginning around how it can help operations. I think there's a lot more use cases as well where it can, you know, really elevate what we're doing. But I think it's going to have to be also very focused on um, really understanding like what's going on on the other flip side of it as well. Yeah, absolutely. It's 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 I say it's such an interesting topic, and it's one we're hearing an awful awful lot about, as you can imagine. And um, I guess another sort of question I had just around this actually was was what's this sort of appetite from your customers to be exploring this? Is there is there a sort of a, he a nervousness, a hesitation, or are they coming to you saying, we really want to be you know, embrace this and, and sort of use it because we can recognize the potential in it? What, what are you sort of seeing there? Yeah, I think 
a, a theme I see a lot, not just with our customers, but just across fintech in general, is just a recognition that to stay ahead and just kind of stay in the game, so to speak, that there's going to have to be some use of AI. You know, we're very much moving past a point, I think, where we can say it's not needed. So I think, you know, whether or not it's transaction monitoring, whether or not it's kind of risk assessment, I think there's a recognition of like how the AI can bring. And I think there's also a recognition that what that can bring can be really powerful. You know, a lot of financial crime is around trying to understand that bigger picture. Like what is this application and how is, you know, what's happening there or what's happening on that account related to something else. And I think as soon as we can start to see that in a more meaningful way and, you know, to be able to hone in on where an investigation is actually useful, then the more power that, you know, at Griffin, we can also bring to customers, right? Because if we're able to kind of actually spot criminal activity and usual activity, and then not only spot it, but sort of then take measures to prevent it or to, you know, uh, see how it then manifests, that's going to be something really powerful that we can offer. So I definitely think there's appetite, but I think there's also what I mentioned before about just kind of recognizing the harm that that can bring as well. And I think it's also about not seeing it as like a magic tool. You know, it's not going to solve every problem. It will create problems of its own. So I think it's very much about using it in a way that's meaningful, um, kind of well thought through, and in a way that's understandable as well. Um, I think a lot of discussion at the moment around AI is, you know, really questioning sometimes how does it work and like what is being used to power in the background. I think any application that we use needs to kind of understand it fully. You know, we need to be able to explain how we're making decisions, how we're coming to outcomes. And I think if we just focus on trying to get to an outcome without that first piece of like, well, how did we get there? Then that's the part that regulators are really, you know, starting to kind of focus on of no matter how you got there, you need to be able to kind of have an explanation. And I think being able to evidence that is going to be really powerful as well. Yeah. Yeah. That's a, it's a great answer. And I, and I think that so I've, I've been sort of selling and marketing to financial services companies for, for quite some time. Um, and historically, there was always a real reluctance, I guess, to outsource parts of their business that were critical to their sort of survival. So security being one and, and, and sort of fraud, fraud prevention and so on. Do you, have you sort of seen in more recent years, uh, especially sort of with, the, with open banking and that kind of, you know, where you're finding very sort of specialist kind of companies come up, that there is more of a willingness now. I think it sort of applies to your answer. So there is that there's sort of an appetite for people to say, well, look, we're not. It's impossible for us to keep up with the, with, the, with the pace of AI ourselves. We need to trust a third-party provider to help us with this. Uh, sort of just tying things back to Verif, I suppose, and, and, and how we can sort of provide, uh, provide assistance for those sorts of organizations. I think it really comes down to what experience do you want to offer? What do you think your strengths are? And then also recognizing um, where you kind of need that additional help and like where something you outsource is actually meaningful. And so I think at Griffin, we're quite unique in that we offer that end-to-end -end experience. You know, we are able to offer and piece together, um, you know, our own internal tools with external tools like Verif to kind of create that start to finish, you know, that we can onboard someone and we can monitor them. I think, that, you know, more broadly in the industry, that willingness to outsource, I think it comes down to more and more companies sort of developing specialisms. And then I think it also comes down to that consideration of even if something has a specialism, even if something is really great at doing one particular thing, how does that actually work with the rest of the infrastructure that you have? Because I think, you know, as partner with Verif was a really, you know, obviously like great addition to the product that we were building because it very seamlessly fit into um, that journey and what we needed. And so I think it's just going into it with that mindset of is this actually going to fit into the broader picture because you could have the most amazing AI um, system, you know, and it's, it's incredibly specialist and you've outsourced that. But if it doesn't play into that broader control framework that you've got, if it's sort of something that people don't understand or it's niche or it's not in a single system, it's then kind of contemplating, is that actually going to bring the value or is that going to um, detract from what you've got and going to cause confusion? So I think it really comes back to there are so many unique parts of financial crime and there are so many things, you know, that can really help 
with a broader picture but I think it is very much seeing it as like a broader puzzle and then kind of what's the overall goal that you're trying to get to and then what can you add in rather than starting from the detail I think it's kind of starting out and then layering back in yeah absolutely which, which ties us back to nicely to what we've, we've talked about throughout this is which is really that sort of customer centricity isn't it and, and having uh, and thoughtful thoughtfulness as you put it I think that that's uh you know, it's it's a really good way of positioning things. What is it that our customers are actually want to do here? What is it that they, that they need? What is stopping them from doing it? And then kind of, you know, thinking about your product set and your solutions to kind of complement that as opposed to, you know, try, trying to backfit the whole thing. Let's talk about the future of, of, of Griffin and some of the developments that, that are going on there. Is there anything kind of exciting that uh, is in your future that, that you'd like to share with us as to what's uh, what's coming up on the on the horizon? Yeah, we're actually at a really exciting stage at the moment. So we're currently in localization and then building out the infrastructure and starting to test with our initial customers, which is super exciting. Um, and I think as part of that, seeing some traction in interesting areas of the market. So. One at the moment that we're seeing a lot of interest in is a prop tech sector and means that we can position ourselves as like a platform that really benefits a lot of the parties within that. So, you know, like letting agents, landlords, tenants. And so that's really exciting. It's kind of like this unique challenge. There's again, some changes in the regulatory space there that means that Griffin kind of partners really well with that sector. Um, and it's become like a really fascinating use case for us, um, especially as we start to build out and um, add on to that financial crime platform that I mentioned at the beginning, you know, sort of really testing that and being able to see what that looks like with this initial um, customer set is really exciting for us. I love that actually. And I know that I said that would be my last question, but I do have one more based on, based on what you've just said, actually. So, so when, when you start to explore a new, a new sector like that, so, so prop tech is obviously the, you know, the area that is, is currently under, uh, under the microscope for you guys then. So how do how do you prepare yourselves for any potentially sort of unthought of fraud that, that you might find in that sector? In that, that you, yeah, you may be prepared for something else if you're looking at a different part of financial services, but if you move into a new part, the, the challenges may be slightly different. Uh, how, how do you pivot like that? I'm just interested from a personal point of view. Really. Yeah, yeah, of course. So I think from the very beginning, from a financial client perspective, our initial um, thought and has always been is to build like a really strong foundation that you can't get anywhere unless you've got that foundation in place and unless the foundation, you know, is rigorous, it's um, comprehensive, it's able to kind of just serve as the base for everything that you do going forward. And so it means that when there is, a, you know, like a new use case like PropTech, that actually because you have that foundation, you can then very much just layer on top additional um, customization that you want and need. And that's kind of how, you know, we like to think about product. It's not building like unique journeys for each customer or it's very much trying to start from the basis of what is common across everything and then what are the additional things that can kind of be added onto that to serve like a unique need and I think doing that means that we get to a place that's much more consistent and um, much more able to kind of have you know like a better data set so then we can use that for you know, management information, AI, that kind of thing. So yeah, I think the pivot is not necessarily so much of a pivot. Of a pivot. It's more around um, like an additional layering on. I see. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. That's a, that's a, that's a great answer. Thank you. And, uh, and, and thanks for everything. This, is, this has been a really interesting conversation, actually. Thanks, Catherine, for joining us. And thanks, everybody, for listening. This podcast is brought to you by Verif. Identity verification made simple. Learn more at verif.com.